Albertino Chamber of Commerce presents City Council Candidate Debate 2018, featuring the candidates running for Cupertino City Council, live from the Cupertino Community Hall. And now for tonight's moderator, Rick Kitson. Good evening. I'm Rick Kitson, Director of Communication for the Cupertino Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us tonight. In 1954, the Cupertino Chamber of Commerce was founded to help create a new city that would be called, coincidentally enough, Cupertino. The Chamber is proud to have been an active part of this dynamic community from the beginning and is excited to continue to promote a thriving and sustainable Cupertino. The vitality and health of our community can be profoundly impacted by its, selected, by its elected officials, which is why we are here tonight. We have eight candidates, eight of our neighbors who live here in Cupertino, Cupertino with us and who care deeply about our community. And one of the things that the Chamber has learned during its many years of operation is that everyone who agrees with you is not necessarily right, and everyone who disagrees with you is not necessarily wrong, which, which is why we are especially proud and pleased to have everyone here this evening. This evening's topics have been selected by members of the Chamber of Commerce, most of whom are small businesses. Earlier this evening, candidates randomly selected topics and they will address those topics in the order in which they appear on the ballot. Those topics are city budget and facilities, development, redevelopment and renovation, housing, regional collaboration, supporting local businesses, traffic, transportation, and what would a political discussion in Cupertino be without Valco? Our candidates, as I'd mentioned, are seated in the order that uh, to my left as they will appear on the ballot. This evening we have Liang Chow, Hi, Darcy everyone. Paul, Savita Vaithanayathan, Hung Wei, John Willie, Hello. Oren Mahoney, Tara Shri Krishnan, and Tim Gorsulowski. Oops, there we go. Thank you. Uh, we have, uh, for each round of these topics, a candidate will present a two-minute statement on the selected topic. Other candidates will have one minute to clarify how their own views may differ or agree with the initial presenter, after which the initial presenting candidate can make concluding remarks. Uh, we would like to remind everyone that we don't every, expect everyone to agree, quite the opposite, which is why we have elections, but we do expect everyone to treat their neighbors in a neighborly fashion. Uh, one of the great charms of Cupertino. So to begin with, we have Liang Chao, who will lead off with housing. Please begin. So I think it's important that we have integrated planning considering all three important factors, housing, office, and transit together. I support quality affordable housing for families, seniors, and people with disability, not just tiny low quality units. We need solid action plans for affordable housing without compromising our quality of life. Any solution for housing has to address the root cause, rapid office growth. Rapid office growth beyond the infrastructure capacity and the lack of viable transit. I will advocate for reliable and efficient transportation solutions serving 
students to seniors and connect essential services and locations such as citywide shuttles. I think we have, in order to address housing, we have to make sure that every project is not, not all project with a tiny bit of, of housing is a housing project. A project like Balco Tier 2 plan actually creates more jobs than the amount of housing it offers. And that actually will create worse in the housing crisis. It will bring in 10,000 more people to compete with our current teachers and the service workers for housing. This kind of um, project will actually worsen housing crisis. We need to make sure it's balanced. And when we already have too much office from Apple Park, also from Main Street, then we need to cool down our office. Also, Cupertino already has many sites already zoned for office. Then we need to balance out the different office and housing sites. Thank you. Thank you. Darcy. I'll uh, wait till uh, we get the time reset here. Uh, the topic is housing. Understood. Ready? Great. So housing is a very important topic to consider. However, we shouldn't be using housing as a pawn in order to help people uh, make more profits. And so where we're at right now is that we have uh, a housing plan that also comes with a jobs plan over at uh, one of our developments and a state housing law that is purportedly uh, supposed to s help fix the housing crisis has now been invoked to create a development proposal that is going to make the housing crisis worse here and overall in the region. Uh, I am okay with making sure that we deliver on the housing units that we need. However, we shouldn't turn this into a cynical and hidden exercise with regard to what our real motivations are here. Uh, it's, it's extremely important that we fix transit if we can deliver on the promise of being able to get us from here over to the Central Valley, we can go and uh, make sure we get there quickly and open up the economy of an entire area of California as well as help our own housing crisis here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Great. Savita, the topic is housing. Okay. We need housing at all levels in the Bay Area. And we need to look at it as a region, not just a city, and look at just numbers of jobs and housing and look at that as a formula. And we need housing for all people at all income levels and all abilities, which is why I voted for the Tier 2 plan, so that people of all abilities and income levels can be housed there, including teachers who would not be accommodated in the SB35 process. And if it's if we are trying to talk about our schools, we have to keep in mind that the teachers are leaving in droves. So how do we accommodate teachers? How do we get our first responders? We need to have housing for people at all levels and address mass transit, which is why I've been working tirelessly on VTA to get mass transit to our area and working with Apple as well as San Jose to bring transit on Stevens Creek Corridor 280 and 85. So housing cannot be discussed without transit in mind. We need housing in our city to accommodate people at all income levels and abilities. Thank you. If I could remind the uh, candidates, the microphones are very directional. So uh, be sure to address them as well as the audience. And uh, we go to you now, Hung, um, on housing. Okay, thank you, Rick. Cupertino needs inclusive housing. We have beautiful single family neighborhood, but we need housing options for e all income levels, for seniors, for teachers, for public employees, for young professionals, and for working families. I believe that we are with inclusive housing options, we are able to build a Cupertino that's more diverse, that's more dynamic, and of course, housing has to come with transit. That's why I am in support of a tier two Velcro specific plan with the housing elements, and we are going to work with transit parallel to the housing so that we are not afraid of traffic, because I think traffic is one issue that concerns everyone. Inclusive housing with parallel traffic uh, um, solutions, that is the way Cupertino needs to go. Thank you. John? <clears throat> yeah, well, the Bay Area has had good fortune in terms of rapid growth, but with it, it brought a tremendous impact to the housing market. <clears throat> and we have also felt that in Cupertino. The prospect of 
uh, 1.75 million square feet of office brings with it 9 to 12,000 employees that want a place to live nearby. Where do we get that kind of housing? The number one thing for the housing is to, to make sure we're not you know, causing more of the problem ourselves. And we need to distribute the housing as best we can, not concentrate it in one little area of the city that's going to create uh, traffic and school crowding. We need to, to be balanced in our community. Thank you. Yeah, housing, yeah, housing is an important issue and it's uh, really changed in Cupertino from people's feeling a few years ago where they were worried about one more child going to their school, having it collapse. Uh, people understand now that actually the enrollment's down in the schools and the schools are financially hurting because of that. But more important, if we can't have housing for our teachers, we're not going to have good schools. Um, we've had, uh, from, for a while, we had a balanced program for housing in the city with the units spread uh, throughout Stevens Creek Boulevard, including the Hills at Valco plan. Um, the group that was opposed to that, interesting enough, now says that they're okay with housing, but uh, the signs at the time said, save our schools. I don't think they were saving them for office and saving them from retail. So housing, we need housing, and of the current plans and ability to do it, I support the Valco specific plan over SB 35. Thank you. Tara? Thank you. Well, uh, we're in a regional housing crisis. Housing is an existential threat along with climate change. How we address housing will ultimately define the well-being of our community long term. I agree with some of the root causes that were mentioned, a major imbalance in jobs versus housing, which has led to a housing shortage. Also, lack of funding for housing at different income levels from our state or federal government. The presidential administration is not helping there. Third, lack of transit and crumbling infrastructure. Uh, we're in a position where we need to build more housing, um, and a lot of folks don't think we have the adequate infrastructure to maintain our quality of life. As a general principle, we shouldn't approve projects that let in substantially more jobs than housing continually. I supported a stricter jobs to housing balance in our zoning before SB 35, and I still support it. I'd also want to work with our state legislators to reform SB 35 and put in a jobs housing balance. We should also fight for an equitable amount of lower income units on new development, tap into Measure A where we can. Thank you. And Tim. So for housing, I don't believe anyone ever reviewed the senior housing situation because I would have been a huge proponent of putting in a really upscale housing for seniors that are retiring that want to stay in the area but can't and still be able to use, utilize their tax incentives for selling their home or whatever the case might be. So that, that in one little, little sweep would free up a lot of residences and offer the, the seniors the opportunity to stay in our area. So for housing, I'm not a huge proponent of the low income housing. Um, it, we do have some in the region already. Um, due to change in the, in the climate of, uh, of our criminal activity that we've seen in other areas, I would not be a huge proponent of it. But we do need to work toward building new residential neighborhoods in, in, within the city. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Now, as uh, I'd mentioned previously, the uh, topics were randomly drawn by the uh, candidates prior to this meeting. And so the next topic will be led off by... Uh, oh, sorry. Thank you. I was just checking to see if you're paying. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. you uh, please, we have one minute closure by Liang. Thank you. So, yeah, I agree that we should support more senior housing in Cupertino also. However, transit is not ever going to appear in the next 10 or 20 years. We can imagine it, but then it might come in 10, 20 years, but not ever. Um, because there hasn't been a plan, there is no funding. However, the Boko Tier 2 plan does not provide housing for teachers or anyone for that is that couldn't find, find housing because 
vocal tier two plan will create more jobs. These people will compete with our teachers for housing. They will compete with all the service workers for housing. And uh, we do need housing, on, we, but we cannot tra trade office. This city council has decided to trade in more double the office for token benefits. This is exact, exactly why this region is in housing crisis, because all the city councils have been favoring office over housing. Thank you. The next topic will be started by Darcy Paul, and that topic is supporting local business. You have two minutes. Great, thanks very much. So before I was elected to the Cupertino City Council in 2014, I was on the board of directors of the Chamber of Commerce. I was their sitting president in 2014, and the way this happened is that I ran for city council in 2009 and didn't get elected, but the board of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, which did uh, endorse me in 2009, asked me to sit on their board. And so uh, I was grateful for that opportunity, was able to run their legislative action committee for uh, several years, and uh, as part of those duties, because the Chamber of Commerce, uh, just like everyone else in this area, was going through rather lean times in 2010, part of those duties were uh, kind of uh, all hands on, uh, on deck kind of effort to make sure that all these various mechanisms of our Chamber of Commerce were functioning properly. One of those mechanisms, as you might imagine, is our Chamber of Commerce directory. Um, at that time, a lot of people were saying, why has the Chamber of Commerce not come out with a directory for four years? And so, uh, as you can imagine, if you don't know anything about publication, it's something that takes a lot of time and effort to do. In addition, you're gathering a lot of different stakeholders and businesses and asking them to support uh, this mechanism of an organization that at the time wasn't doing that great. This took a lot of work. It took a lot of perseverance. And it also took um, the ability to sit down with the people delivering our publication and making sure that they actually delivered that product. So we did that in the iteration between 2010 and 2011. After that, we took our Chamber of Commerce directory in-house, and I actually led that effort uh, with our current CEO, Anjali Kauser, to actually get that published um, by ourselves. The reason I relate this story is that it is indicative of the work and the perseverance that I put in to talk to our stakeholders about the various issues that are confronting the small businesses, and also to indicate that there are a lot of moving parts in our community uh, and a lot of this background work that needs to be done. So I'll continue to do that in the next four years and um, you know, just making sure that we have integrity in our processes also makes sure that our businesses are confident in our government. Thanks very much. Thank you, Darcy. Uh, Savita? Thank you. Uh, so before my life on council, I was also an uh, entrepreneur and I was also supporting women entrepreneurs uh, start their own businesses. Uh, so on council, I've been part of an economic develop development strategic uh, council, a committee, and we meet very regularly. And in the last two years, there's actually been a proposal for three distinct areas of innovation in Cupertino. Uh, one is the incubator and accelerator business project. The second is the mobile vendor uh, pilot project. And the third is the innovation district vision plan. I've been working tirelessly on this and encouraging people who want to have startups to come to our meetings and give us their vision and tell us where they want these uh, incubators to be placed. And we're trying to revitalize some of the retail spaces which may not get as much attention to be an incubator space. We have our youth who are interested in uh, starting their own businesses and have their business plans ready to go. So it's a constant innovation of people who want to be in different businesses, be it restaurants or any other kind of startups. That is something I've been encouraging with the Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Han? Supporting local businesses is part of the council's job. And um, oh, I would do three things. First is review the processes of applications for local businesses, streamline the process, make the cost lower so that the local business and established business in Cupertino are really in a, with a good start. And then we need to review what kind of business are already in Cupertino and have a diverse type of service business, restaurants, 
um, home-based business and high-tech company. One of the things in uh, specific Velcro too is we do have a lot of office spaces, but we could attract another major high-tech company so that we don't have just one high-tech company that supplies and with our revenues. So that's actually a plus. You know, there are always pros and cons on everything, but that's one thing Cupertino can explore. Another high-tech company that could, uh, you know, give us more revenues and so that we're not dependent upon just one. And the third thing is, I believe council members need to be a leader in supporting local business host programs and eat and shop in Cupertino. Thank you. John? Yeah. <coughs> so our community consists of two main items, small business, but the residents. Our community is all of us. And so I see the process needs to truly start with the residents. The residents are the ones that decide where and how much uh, business there should be, the densities, and once that's established and really outlined in the general plan, then the small businesses are free to go and, and be as productive as they possibly can. Unfortunately, when uh, the, uh, the developer like for Valco wants so much at one spot, our whole city suffers. And so we need to, to get back to balance. And the community will be happy, small business will be happy, and everything will be nice here in Cupertino, as opposed to being just out of sync, out of balance, traffic, congestion. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Oren. Yeah, so I've been uh, involved with small business here in Cupertino for a long time. I was on the chamber board as well a long time ago until I, uh, until I got elected the first time. Um, and I think I was on the council when we hired an economic development uh, officer for the city to specifically work on small businesses in the city. Uh, believe it or not, at the time when I was on the chamber board, the chamber didn't get involved in the political process. And uh, we had a lot of discussions about, uh, for an advocacy point of view, whether that was a good thing to do. And obviously it's moved on since then to where the chamber actually interviews and endorses candidates. And I think that's an important part of the process of them representing small business. Um, I go to every chamber event, and I do that. I've done it while I was on the council. I was there for every mixer, every ribbon cutting that I could, and uh, every LIC, uh, Legislative Action Committee meeting. It's just part of, of being there. And it's important that the council always does seek the chamber's input on anything that's going to affect small business. We may not go with that position, but we always seek their input. Thank you. Tara. Great. Well, I want to talk about some of the key issues businesses in Cupertino are facing and some of my ideas. Uh, we have a lack of affordable office spaces for mid-sized businesses, if you think 20,000 square feet, 200,000 square feet. Lack of diversity in revenues in our general fund, about 18% comes from Apple. And just an overall challenging economic time for traditional independent retailers. You see small businesses closing down along Stevens Creek uh, and De Anza. Some of my ideas, we, I think we should balance office and housing space so small businesses won't be priced out. Um, we can also create a small business hub at City Hall. Small businesses incorporate uh, the lifeblood of our city. We have over 3,000 small businesses, and a hub could coordinate and expedite permitting, licensing, payment, et cetera. We could also work on a Legacy Business of the Month program, which is something I have experience doing to highlight the history of our longtime small businesses. Um, we can also follow the lead of neighboring cities to work on a TMA with our businesses, also look at a bid, a business improvement district for Stevens Creek. Thank you. Great, thank you. Tim. So after being in business for, I was going to tell you 30, 35 years, <laughs> but I, I'm afraid to tell you, but it's the truth. So I can tell you the ins and outs. I've helped a lot of small business owners start, and it's actually fun to do. And that's one process I'd love to work with the local people and get them started into a small business and promote them and teach them what actually, what's the laws and what's the, pro I heard that word streamline a, a moment ago. That's one thing I'm huge in. I, I get so frustrated we're stuck with a lot of the laws in this state, and there's nothing we can do to change them in the short term. But to make a long story short, I will work to make sure 
that people follow the proper processes and make it more simple. And in addition to that, I'll bring back some of the high tech companies that we've lost here because those are huge for this city for long term. In a downturn, you'll, you'll say old Tim was right on that one. Great, thank you. Liang. Yes. So business is, businesses are essential part of Cupertino and when we provide quality of life depends on the services of the business provide. In, we are in the middle of Silicon Valley, the central part. However, Cooper, our, both of our shopping malls are failing. This is a lack of leadership by the city council. We have a fluent uh, population. People are, can, uh, but then we are forced to go out of town to shop. If we, the city council can step in, figure out the consumer needs, what kind of services our residents would need, provide those services, those shops in Volco, in Oaks. Of course people are going to line up to shop locally and we will generate sales tax. So, and then also the city can provide a platform for the local businesses to reach out the, to customers, not only in Cupertino and area-wide. We can help our businesses to be successful. Thank you, and Darcy, back to you for Yeah, I'm gonna go back to my original theme here. We need to be having council members willing to do the work. Um, one of the things that most people don't know is that we had about 30,000 square feet at Main Street dedicated to innovation hub, incubator type of startup space. That did not get used. I was the only council member that actually uh, reached out to stakeholders. I reached out to uh, one of the administrators at the local small business administration. I didn't have a majority that was willing to work and go ahead and say, look, let's focus our energies on this available space. And so the issue really is not so much the decisions. The issue is the willingness to put in the work, uh, to look at the various items that are there and have those conversations that are meaningful and uh, be able to say, look, let's go ahead and put this on the agenda. Let's make uh, sure that we're looking at things like uh, the expenses of various um, small businesses and see how we can alleviate those types of stresses. So uh, my theme is let's put in the work, let's get a majority willing to do that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. On to our next topic, Savita has drawn development, redevelopment, and renovation. Thank you. I'm just waiting for the time to start. Okay, I'm looking at your clock. Uh, it, it encompasses the first two questions that we answered. Uh, we develop, we redevelop, we renovate. And if we don't, we die. So we have to be thinking smart and develop smartly. And definitely keep in mind that we do not encroach open spaces and green spaces. That's really very important to me. When we talk about development, it needs to be, especially with terms of high density housing and office, has to be in transit corridors. We need to keep in mind transportation and absolutely work with the TDM. And in fact, we did uh, have a study about two years ago to have a traffic impact. And that is something which we absolutely have now. So if there's any development, there's going to be a traffic, traffic impact, impact fee. So when you talk about development and redevelopment, there are some mitigating measures that are already in place. When we talk about renovating, you have to think about revitalizing spaces in retail which are currently suffering. When we talked about incubator earlier, it's about those spaces at the back of a furniture store where no one goes. That can be revitalized. We need to think about small spaces which can be given a new life. That's called renovation. Our community is constantly looking for spaces to socialize. We need community rooms for that. Just like we energized our neighborhood parks, we need to energize community space in place which originally was retail, which is no longer being used. That is a way to revitalize. Uh, I would also like to talk about uh, the, the innovation vision plan. This is part of the EDSP. And if you want to learn more, please go to our website. It is a very conclusive plan. It is something that's exhaustive. We talk about innovating in different districts all over the city. And every uh, PDA that is coming up on different corridors has a comprehensive plan. So please take a look at that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
and hung. A city does not stand still. You know, Cupertino is a unique city. In the south, we're bordering Saratoga, Los Gatos, beautiful neighborhood, great schools, open space. In the north, our Stevens Creek borders Sunnyvale, Mountain View, we have high-tech industries. So development, redevelopment to me is the corridor from Oak Shopping Center all the way that connects to Daredown Station to San Jose. So that's where we concentrate our redevelopment uh, projects. You know, every, like Savita says, every corner can be developed into really nice, innovative, energy efficient complexes. And that we need transit eventually to go from all the way from Oak Shopping Center to Daredown Station. So that that's going to, Daredown Station is going to be the hub of, of, of our Silicon Valley. And that's where we can transfer all our Cupertino residents to work, connect housing with work, all the way from North to Sunnyvale to Mountain View. So my view for Cupertino is we have the best of two elements, suburban and a little bit urban on Stevens Creek Boulevard. Thank you. John. So <clears throat> why do we like being here? We like Cupertino. We came. We settled here. And true. Our, our community is growing. It started out at 20,000, and we're now at 65,000, and we're still growing. And uh, different areas need to be redeveloped, and sounds great. We need to be aware of the fact that Cupertino is the way it is because of the general plan. The general plan set the, the criteria for how our community is laid out that we all like. And when somebody comes in and buys a particular site, and wants to redevelop it, great, as long as it's within the confines of what's allowed in the general plan and on that site. When they want to go and change it, then we need to, to have the community involvement. We need to have the resident's voice. And I will be out there talking to the residents, making sure the residents are going to be the ones deciding for the changes of our future. Thank you. Thank you, John. Oren. Yeah, I think one thing we all agree on, if you stand still in today's world or just even in yesterday's world, you're going to lag behind. And we have no better example of that than the Valco Shopping Center. Uh, fortunately, the rest of the shopping centers, or almost all the rest of the shopping centers, have undergone renovation and have moved forward. Um, we now have, you know, Sprouts and Party City, where it once was an empty Mervyn's building. Uh, we have the Safeway store that brought a mainstream uh, uh, shopping uh, mainstream grocery store back into Cupertino when, when we had lost all of them. Um, Cupertino Village is a thriving, thriving uh, shopping area. Um, even in small examples like Seish Way uh, got redeveloped and, and in, a, in a positive way where it was integrated in with the existing facilities there in Panera. Uh, to solve some of the parking problems. So we've done that. We've done a whole, we've done a number of good examples of that. We need to go and take the last ones that we have in Cupertino and work on them as well. Thank you. Tara. Thanks. Well, first and foremost, I've publicly uh, refused and renounced uh, contributions from developers either directly on my campaign or through independent expenditures, and I think that should be a clause added to our voluntary campaign pledge that candidates sign. So folks know if we're approving a project, it's because we have the community's interests at heart. Oftentimes, cities are accountable for housing production. Housing is state mandated. Uh, these allocations are state mandated, but we're not given adequate funding for below market rate housing or transportation infrastructure. So I support uh, lobbying for statewide legislation that would link housing goals with transportation funding so cities would be able to build both. In terms of the aesthetics of our city, I support the community vision and our general plan, which preserves residential areas for one or two story buildings, uh, along with ADUs and allows for higher heights in the planned development areas in the middle of our city. Some best practices, uh, we should incorporate recycled water, green infrastructure, green building standards. Um, thank you, Re reusing demolition debris, thank you. You could just use up my minute, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> you were on a roll. So housing, I, I love re revitalizing. I love to see progress. And when you look around a lot of our local cities, a lot of them came from, I know I've bought homes. There, a lot of them were 50s, 60s, and some in the 70s. So it's all old technology. It's very poor. Believe me, I've worked with PG&E to 
work on issues with places where they, we've lost a lot of the, uh, it's just not energy efficient at all. They're terrible. A lot of the old, the old buildings and the old homes, I love to see them, but I would love to make sure at the same time, we're not going to a postage stamp lot and putting a huge dinosaur of a house on it. I'd love to see that stay within the realm of where we're going right now. And there are a lot of new homes being built, but I will promote new business industry in here big time because I, I think it's, it's a huge thing. It's very much needed for our residents. Thank you. And Liang, the topic is development, redevelopment, and renovation. Definitely the city needs to grow, but then to grow, we need to plan. We need city planning and we need regional planning. We need long-term plan. We don't want to use the money we don't have. We don't want to assume there will be transit coming and then power up people and the workers when we don't have a plan that can bring transit yet. So when we talk about city planning, if we already have too much office and this one side wants to rezone shopping mall to office, what we need to look at is citywide. What other sites are already zoned for office? If we give 30 years worth of office to one site that wasn't zoned for office, that's unfair to all the other property owners who, have, who own sites that's already zoned for office. The same thing for housing. We need planning. And in terms of infrastructure, if we one, if, if we plan to have senior, senior center and library and city hall, we should have do a study so that we can charge infrastructure impact fees so it's fair, not project by project. Thank, Thank you. you. Darcy. Okay, we need council members that are be willing to do the work of the job. And the work of the job in this context is to make sure that we're balancing residential sentiment with the city's needs and opportunities. Residential sentiment. In the last four years, I have made it a point Whenever anyone reaches out to me, I will go ahead and say, let's meet, let's talk, let's try to figure out what these issues are. It's easy to try to ignore those emails and try to act like, well, I didn't get it, I don't know what you're talking about, but at the end of the day, you can take a look at my schedule for the last four years, every single person who has reached out, I have made it a point to meet with them. That is work. It is work to try to balance out those sentiments with what our needs are. If we don't uh, figure out what our needs are, then what ends up happening is that we're, we're met with these situations where very well resourced interests say to us, we need this. And instead of us saying, okay, let's, let's, let's have a talk, we end up rolling. We need to be able to analyze and push back and say, this is what our bargaining leverage is. I shouldn't be the only person doing this. We need a majority that is willing to do that work. Thank you. Thank you. And Savita for close. When I came into the city over 23 years ago, there were three orchards that I can remember, and one right here on Rodriguez Avenue. Those are now houses. They got redeveloped for a particular reason. Having been serving on the VTA board, the one thing I've been asking for is mass transit to our neighborhood. And I keep getting the response, you don't have density, you will not get mass transit. So if we redevelop, keeping that in mind, on the transit corridors, increasing density there. Then we'll have a cohesive community where everyone can live together, get a shuttle service for getting people from here uh, throughout the city and to uh, Caltrain and other mass transit multimodal uh, agencies. That's what we need to do. If we keep thinking of ourselves with walls around us, we'll never grow. We'll be the pass through for everybody else who'll use ways to go through us. We need to develop and find mass transit to come to our city and help our residents throughout. Great. Thank you. Our next topic will be city budget and facilities. And led off by Hung Wei. City budget facilities, that's actually one of my favorite topics. Um, for 11 years on Fremont Union High School District, our budget is over $100 million, and I believe our city's budget is $140,000. There are three parts as a leader in the city. First is to really to maintain fiscal health, have a healthy reserve, and also um, build good relationships with our employee groups. That is so important in maintaining a good budget for our city. And the second part is really to prioritize what we're going to do with our budget to help our residents. Mostly, what I would prioritize is for public safety, park and recreation, road maintenance, and 
library parking problems. These are all to maintain our quality of life. We heard a lot of candidates say that they are for the residents, but the most important part in a city council's job in budgeting is actually to represent our residents in fighting for extra budget, just like in Measure B. I believe a couple of council members fought for $350 million Measure B funding for Corridor 85 Corridor. Now it's in the um, study session and the money is being released from the lawsuit. We represent our residents to fight for extra budget. We build relationships with groups outside of our city and then we, uh, for example, build relationships with neighboring cities to have a real transit solution for our Cupertino. Um, some candidates say that it's not possible. It is possible. We need to be doers. We need to be out there representing our residents, fight for extra revenue to really solve our regional transit issues. And so these are what the, a council member need to do. Internally, make sure we have physical health, prioritize to make sure our quality of life is being taken care of, but outwardly represent our residents to fight for extra rev revenues to really resolve our traffic issues so that we have a really the best Cupertino for all the residents. Thank you. John? <clears throat> so, fiscal responsibility, absolutely. I, I make sure our family really adheres to that. And so, the city is actually in very good shape. So I won't suggest that there are, are things that have to be changed. We're, we're not uh, 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 over budget. We don't need to borrow money. So, so we have pretty good fiscal health. So then what do we want to do with our community? Do we want to transform our com community in ways that the residents don't want in, in the interest of satisfying a big developer? Is, is that what anybody here wants? No, our community, it's, it's in good shape, and let's make sure the residents are the ones that are deciding where our community's future is gonna go, that uh, what's right for our community, traffic, schools, things of that nature, and we will all have a wonderful community to be a part of. Thank you. Thank you, Oren. Yeah, so a budget is driven by two things, revenue and expenses. The city does a really good job of controlling expenses, especially by contracting out our sheriff's department and the fact that uh, we use county fire, which has its own pension system. Uh, revenue is important. We get less property tax than almost every other city historically. Um, we got that upped a little bit. So we rely a lot on sales tax and hotel taxes. And a lot of that's driven by our big employer, Apple. Uh, Apple's direct and indirect benefits to the city are substantial. So it's interesting when we keep talking about the residents versus the big bad developers. When the Apple Park was approved, that was for the residents. They're paying for your parks, they're paying for paving your streets, they're paying for all the other facilities that you have here. So it's not, nobody approved that project because we like Steve Jobs or thought that, you know, it was going to be a pretty building, although it is a pretty building. We did it for the residents because that's what pays the bills. Thank you. Tara. Thanks. Well, I support uh, our city's measures to remain fiscally responsible, um, including our 20-year plan to help uh, address our unfunded pension liabilities. I think our main expenses will be maintenance of our public facilities, streets, parks, garbage, and our main capital expense will be civic center revitalization, which will be uh, expansion of a, the program room at the main library site, hopefully an underground garage, because parking at the civic center is a nightmare, um, and a new city hall, which needs to be seismically retrofitted. Um, how are we gonna pay for this? 10% can come from our general fund, uh, and a large part can come from a lease financing agreement, which we would pay from our general fund in installments over the next 15 to 20 years. Um, I do think we should prioritize our library and support our community's quest for knowledge. I think the library is the centerpiece of our city. Thanks. Tim. Again, uh, back to he's referencing Apple. You know, we got to bring we got to bring high paying jobs. We got to bring good paying jobs here. That's what it's all about. And and that's at the end of the day, that's going to be your nickel. That's going to be a long term nickel for the for the city. And again, we we had talked about previously 
uh, not handling funds properly within the city. I've, I've always promoted and I've worked as an investigator with, I'm not going to tell you the names, but I've worked with some huge uh, companies that go in and actually audit. Uh, they're huge auditors, you would know the name, but they're, uh, they're third party auditors. They come in, they audit everything to make sure what happened in this city doesn't happen again. Because I wouldn't tolerate that. I, I would uh, definitely promote that as part of, part of my future with the city. Thank you. Liang. As a school board member, the first thing I did was to compare the badge budget over the several years. And then I find out there, there are in extraordinary increase, even though our, our enrollment was dropping. And I keep raising the question. Finally, with the super, new superintendent, we, he uh, reduced the size of, of the administration because there were some one-time state funding, but then we, we hired more people and kept them on, on going. So I think it's important that for the city also to look at what, how much we are spending hiring consultants? Are they all necessary? Should we, can we save some money by um, giving, hiring um, city staff to, to do the job? And for example, um, if we have long-term facility cost, we should do a nexus, nexus study so that we can average the cost for different development projects in t instead of uh, one project at a time. Thank you, Darcy. First and foremost, when it comes to budgeting and finances, we have to fight for integrity. From 2000 to 2014, shortly before I came onto council, there was a former employee that was accused now in a criminal prosecution of embezzling approximately $800,000 from Cupertino. This does not come in a vacuum. This comes because there is a culture. There is a culture of laxness and the ability to do this because our systems are not strong enough. As an audit committee member and as the mayor this year, as soon as I found out about this, every single one of the expenses of the city of Cupertino has been scrutinized. I will not sign a budget or an expenditure um, document until I have had a meeting with the director of finance and one of our primary accountants to find out what each and every one of these expenditures, if I'm unclear on it, uh, does. So that is the first thing we need to do. We need to fight for integrity. We also need to do the work. Uh, we need to do the work of figuring out Okay, our community loves libraries, it loves parks, and we need to figure out a way in order to make those priorities as opposed to rolling for large moneyed interests. Thank you very much. Thank you. Savita. Uh, we have been a fiscally prudent city, and our budgets indicate that we are also a stable city. Uh, a fourth, uh, I would say our revenues are split about a fourth from sales tax, property tax, uh, charge for services, and the remaining fourth approximately uh, is tra uh, transit occupancy taxes. But we do have an over-dependence on Apple, so we need to diversify. We need to keep that in mind going forward when we develop. We have to get other businesses in town so we don't rely only on Apple. How we use our funding, we've been very prudent about it, and even trying to rebuild City Hall, the reason I voted for Tier 2 is that we will get a City Hall, even if it's a warm shell. And then we can put that money that we had set aside for City Hall towards library and other services. And I even asked the, the developer right here during that meeting if they'll help with the library. And they said they would. So we will get something else in place here in City Hall, make sure it's seismically safe, and make sure that we have money for libraries and parks and keep our public safe, which is of extreme importance. Great, and hung for close. Okay, budget, healthy budget, good relationship with our employees, prioritize our budget for the quality of life of our residents, and again, I wanna emphasize that council members' main job is actually to get extra budget so that we can improve our quality of life. For example, Apple Park, as Oren says, we're not on the, they're not on the Apple's pockets. They are actually on the residents' pocket. Sand Hill, that's going to build $30 million for our city hall, as Savita said. It's going to save us probably another $30 million. And that's going to be used for park and recreation, for road maintenance. That's a council member's main job is to actually to get more budget for our residents. So we are here. Everybody's here for the residents. But we need to really get out there to, tr to really have 
solid connection to solve our transit issues, to really build a best Cupertino going forward. Great. Thank you very much. The next topic uh, will be led off by John Willie. This is something that I think everyone agrees is uh, there's not enough of. Transportation. <clears throat> so yes, right, Trans transportation. You know, having grown from 20,000 to 65,000 people and all of the Bay Area has grown so much and we all feel the effects of it, uh, 280, 85, 101. Well, we know that the future is going to cause us to, to use different modes of transportation and so we definitely need to be aware of all these and working toward them. If we, if we take the, the biggest one that would uh, help and that would be uh, uh, VTA getting us a rapid transit system. Unfortunately, it's a long-term project. It's not something that's going to show up next year or even the year after. With an engineering group, I toured the Deer Drawn Station and it's beautiful. And I asked them, when's it coming to Cupertino? And they said, we haven't got a clue. So we definitely need to be working with them. I'll, I'll definitely work with uh, 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 VTA. I'll be taking my engineering expertise of being a licensed engineer. What are the challenges that would uh, uh, kind of keep it from coming and help to remove those challenges? Okay, well, if it's not going to be here anytime soon, what are the other options? Well, shuttles, great. I support shuttles. Once again, it's not something that's going to show up this year, next year, and even when the shuttles do show up, it's going to take a mindset change to get us out of our cars and into the shuttles. We need the, the first mile to get to where the shuttle is, and then we need the last mile to get from the shuttle to our destination. <coughs> So it'll take time. It's not going to uh, decrease the, the traffic. There's the employer-based programs. We should be advocating for those, uh, using uh, their buses for their transportation, putting housing as much as we can without over, over uh, uh, saturating areas uh, where we can. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Oren. So uh, transportation is probably where I'm a little uh, separated from some of my fellow uh, council people. Uh, the way that the amount of density we have, in my opinion, does not support uh, certainly light rail down Stevens Creek Boulevard or even bus rapid transit down Stevens Creek Boulevard. It doesn't, it wouldn't affect, it'd negatively affect traffic by taking a lane out. Um, if we have a dedicated lane, we've got to utilize it more than just for uh, an occasional bus or, or a light rail vehicle. So I'm trying to look ahead at what's going to happen as we have more autonomous vehicles and how as people use those for the first and last mile that we talked about, then they could link together virtually into a bus. Instead of getting out of your vehicle and waiting for a bus, it would all hook together and they could use a dedicated lane. Then it would be used more effectively. That's still pretty far in the future, 10 to 20 years. In the short term, I think we can look uh, very seriously about some intelligent traffic signals that would dynamically change the traffic lights based on the uh, traffic at the time. Great, right, thank you. Tara. Thanks, well, experts agree transit is the most elusive element of solving our regional housing crisis because it's our main system to get from our jobs to our house. Um, and unfortunately, Cupertino is lacking in transit options. You know, it's best practice to have a job center near a transit center. We're a job center, but we don't have a transit center. What can we do now? Citywide shuttles, I've been campaigning on this for a while, and I think all the candidates on the stage would agree that it could be a great short-term measure we could implement. So I'm hopeful to see it in the near future. Transit technology is evolving, as Oren mentioned. Many forward-looking studies show us in autonomous self-driving vehicles 10, 20 years from now, maybe even sooner. I personally don't want to see public transit left behind because many people depend on public transit. So I'd want to see how public agencies could best utilize this technology, whether it's an on-demand last mile bus, shared lanes. Keep in mind we need transportation projects that are carbon free, are low carbon. Caltrain's expected to be carbon free by 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tim. So I was there when, uh, when they were cutting the ribbon for, for the little light rail and oh, what a wonderful thing. 
So when you go down there and you actually watch light rail and then you start asking how many people ride the thing, it's scary because that's, it was built to help people for crying out loud. What we have found in a lot of communities in different counties than this even is the park and ride is wonderful. So that's a, that's a really good thing. But when they get to the park and ride, who did, do they actually, are they riding with someone? Or could we also provide a shuttle from a park and ride that would take them into the center of the Silicon Valley if that be where the people were going? So there's a lot of options that could be, could take place. The, the transportation in the Silicon Valley has always been bad. It's not right now. It's always, there, no one ever had a real good plan as Darcy and I were talking about 30 years ago, if we would have had some of these good, great ideas underground, it would be a different world right now. Thank you. Thank you. Liang. Traffic, traffic, traffic has been the biggest issue that everyone mentions. However, transportation solution doesn't come. And for the long term, I think Cupertino does need the shuttle services. We need that for our, our students going to school and then we need our seniors who have less mobility. I would like to advocate for shuttle buses for Cupertino at least to connect essential locations in Cupertino. And then countywide, I think we do need to work on solutions to provide commuter buses for our public agency employees and uh, a lot of employees who need it. So that it's not just Apple employee or Google employee have the luxury of uh, comm commuter, commuter buses. However, we need council members who don't just follow VTA leadership. VTA has failed. They have, the ridership of buses has dropped. The ridership even in Los Angeles, when they have worked on trans housing near transit, has dropped. We need uh, new leadership to look at what we need are shops near transit stops, not housing. Thank you, Darcy. When it comes to transit, gridlock has happened when we have taken the path of least resistance. We need to do the work in order to get an effective mass transit system done, and we need it done quickly. Uh, quickly doesn't mean we wait 10 or 20 years. Quickly means we set an ambitious timetable on a schedule such as four or five years out, and we try to get that done. Today in the news, there was news about Los Angeles having its first underground um, tunneling um, uh, project uh, opened by one of our uh, foremost entrepreneurs of our day. We need to go ahead and consolidate that. We need to ask Apple uh, to go ahead and contribute to this. I understand they are now in the transit conversation. Uh, I was very much central in getting that done in terms of making sure that we have, um, instead of a tax, a conversation with our major stakeholder company. I have been the only mayor in the last several years to actually go to the head of VTA and have a conversation. We need to be able to look at these points of resistance and be able to have intelligent conversations uh, instead of saying this is a pipe dream and it will never happen. Thank you, Savita. So I have been on the VTA PAC and board for the last four years. I have never seen anyone at any of the meetings. So I know how this works. I know how long-term solutions work. I know how short-term solutions work. And I was instrumental in talking to Apple and getting that on paper from them to say that they will support us in the plans that VTA has in place for Stevens Creek Corridor as well as 280 and 85. And that didn't happen until I actually spoke with the mayor of San Jose and Santa Clara and the county to get them all to agree for a solution on Stevens Creek Corridor, which is BRT. And that will come to our council soon. I'm, I'm sure it's going to come to us very soon because now Measure B uh, dollars will be released. Uh, for near-term solutions, I vo voted for the Tier 2 so that we can have the shuttle service in cooperation with Valco and Apple for our residents for uh, getting to their places of work all around the city and to Caltrain. I was part of the board that approved the electrification for Caltrain. I was part of the VTA board that approved the tunneling for BART. These things take forever and it goes into billions of dollars and you need local funding, you need state funding, you need federal funding to make anything happen. Thank you. Hung Wei. 
I am committed to build coalitions with neighboring cities and negotiate with Apple to bring resources for frequent and reliable transit to our region. Yes, it's not going to happen in the next one or two years, but development, redevelopment is not going to happen in the one to one or two years. So this parallel transit solution has to come when we redevelop our regions from Valco to Oaks all the way to Daredown Station. It's so important to do that. And Citywide shuttle as a short-term solution is really great, as Tara says. Remember that Valco specific plan offers a $1 million setup for a citywide shuttle and $750 million for nine years operating it. That is what our city needs. And I think that's a benefit that this council members fought for our residents. It is good for our residents. They're not in the developer's pocket. They actually are in our residents' pocket. So um, short-term wise, let's do some collaboration. Long-term wise, yes, collaboration with neighboring cities, collaborate with Apple, and build real transit to our region. Thank you. And John? Uh, well, yeah, well, you know, for the other candidate that doesn't want to think outside of the box, you're right, it would never happen. And that type of thinking would have not brought BART from Union City to Fremont to Melpitas to San Jose. And when I went to Deirdre Station with the engineering group and we talked to them, they do have it already on the map. It's just they don't have any funding. It will happen. There will be a, a BART or similar link going up the south side of the bay. San Francisco already has BART down to the airport. It's going to come, but it, it won't come for many years. But still, we need to be working on those long-term solutions and then doing what short-term solutions we can do in the meantime. We do have traffic problems now. We need to be looking at those. I would be taking a serious look at our most congested uh, road segments and intersections and then implementing uh, improvements to help relieve some of this congestion that we all suffer with daily. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And we will begin a series of topics that, um, again, these were all identified by chamber members as a priority for our community. And uh, I think as the candidates will all see, these are all closely related. Uh, we just finished uh, transportation, which I think everyone agrees we don't have enough of. And there will be, later on, we'll be discussing traffic, which everyone agrees we have too much of. So, in the meantime, uh, our next topic will be uh, led off by Orrin Mahoney, uh, regional collaboration. So, regional collaboration is critical. Cupertino is really a small city. We're small but mighty, but, you know, even in the Bay Area, we're a small city, and certainly compared to cities around the world where people are saying, well, what about the transportation here and there? So, whatever we do, we do have to work together with our other cities. Every problem we talk about, traffic, water, flood control, air quality, housing, sanitation, public safety, every one of those requires regional collaboration. Um, when I was on the council, I was not on the, the, uh, the VTA board, but I was on the advisory committee and the water, water uh, boards. Um, we do need to work together. We have a lot of similarities, especially with our West Valley cities that, that have some of the similar uh, types of activities we do. Um, it's because of the collaboration and the partnerships I've established in the past that I have uh, many of the past and current elected officials that are supporting me in this campaign. I'm kind of known as a collaborator within the city, but also across with other cities as well. And I think that's just an important thing to have on the council. Thank you. Tara. Thanks. Well, our three major regional issues work in conjunction. They are traffic, housing, and the environment. You can't address one without affecting the other, and they all should be tackled regionally. Um, keep in mind that our county has the most residents and jobs uh, more than any other county in the Bay Area, and the Bay Area as a whole is expected to grow by 2 million people in the next 25 years. I'm a firm believer that economic prosperity, environmental justice, and social justice can be achieved together. Cupertino, as Oren mentioned, represents, has representation that sits on a number of regional boards that oversee air, water, transit, energy, my favorite being Silicon Valley Clean Energy, our community choice aggregator. But in my opinion, we lack in a regional planning board. We need sustainable regional strategies, 
responsible growth strategies to provide housing and transportation solutions while reducing our carbon footprint. I support Plan Bay Area 2040, which was a plan approved by the Association of Bay Area Governments and MTC. They follow a few uh, responsible growth strategies. You can look on my website. You can have kept on. You can just told my part. <laughs> so regional collaboration is humongous. It is, again, as Orrin was talking about, you know, it's a smaller city, so we're dependent. Listen, when 9-11 when came, the world stopped. The, a lot of you guys were here when we had the big earthquake. The world stopped. We depend on each other during those times, but there are other times when there's not huge emergencies and we're still dependent on other services. And I think as part of a council, we need to have a committee that seeks and, and puts these groups together because it's so huge that you're, you're associated with these other neighboring groups and we pull everybody, who are they? Are we missing some that would actually help us? on a day-to-day -day basis, let alone during those huge emergencies when everything falls apart. So we do need each other, it's humongous. And I, I think that works, I, it was proved, proven that this process works. Thank you. Thank you. Liang, uh, regional collaboration. So um, regional collaboration is very important to, for various issues. For example, is the airplane noise issue with the collaboration between Cupertino, Sunnyvale, and various cities, we were able to get FAA to uh, replan the route of airplane. And uh, for in terms of regional development, whatever Palo Alto built, when they build three times more office than housing, it affects our housing prices. When we build a lot more housing, a lot more office than housing, we crowd the 280, which is already the most congested section in Silicon Valley. So whatever we do affect other cities. Every city council wants more office, but then it's irresponsible, to, it's selfish to only want revenue by trading in office space. We need to be responsible if the kind of token benefits we get from office space is not worth the impact. Thank you, Darcy. The keys to regional collaboration are the exact same as the keys to interpersonal collaborations. You have to have respect and you have to build relationships. With regard to the respect, you cannot get the respect if you're not doing the work, if you're not pushing back, if you're not analyzing, if you're not going, look, at the end of the day, here's our bargaining position. Here's a pro forma. This is how much we want and this is why we want it. If you're not doing that work, you're not going to be able to garner that respect going forward. That is exactly the same way in an interpersonal relationship. You can have someone think that, well, you're a really nice person. I'll, I'll go to you uh, anytime I want anything because that's the relationship. That is not a relationship. That is not good for you. It's not good for your community. With regard to regional collaborations on the transit level, uh, when I thought about a transit solution in terms of connecting Cupertino over to Deardon Station, I have met with stakeholders, I have met with elected officials, uh, as well as uh, staff members in San Jose and Santa Clara. I've been trying to get VTA on board. I don't think that we look at it and go, look, at the end of the day, we need to be able to, um, we need to, be able to you know, blow up relationships. We need to make these relationships better, and that's how you get things done. Thank you. Thank you. Savita. Um, we in Cupertino are not in suburbia. We have two major highways running through us, 85 and 280, and Stevens Creek Corridor. We need to be really good neighbors with the cities that border us. And the West Valley region in especially, we are five cities, and our population is barely 160,000. So we are next to a big city, which is over a million in population. We need to work together to make anything happen, especially with transit. Being on the VTA board has taught me a lot about trying to get something for the West Valley region. Only if we have density, we'll get transit here. 
that has been said again and again and again, otherwise the dollars will go to San Jose. So we need to work with the neighboring cities of Santa Clara, San Jose, and the county like I have to get mass transit to us. The other boards that we need to be part of is MTC, ABAG, BACMED, because air quality is really important, and uh, also the business community of SVLG, as well as the joint Silicon Valley vent uh, Ventures. It is really important that we have rep representatives with the Santa Clara Valley Water District too. Thank you. Hung Wei. As a school board member and a city council member, regional collaboration is a must. We work with neighboring cities to improve our quality of life together. I'll give you two solid examples. One of them is the Measure B funding for $350. The West cities got together and fought for it. That's what we got it. That's regional collaboration. Another example is Apple and the water, uh, Santa Clara Water District in Sunnyvale had a recycling water pipe that's uh, done at Sunnyvale, and then that's feeding into Apple, but only a small percentage is being used by Apple. Any development in Sunnyvale and Cupertino can make use of that. I'm going to quote Catherine Owen, the Deputy Operating Officer at the Water District. She said, Apple drove this project. It is really a true partnership of both public and private agencies. City Council members need to represent our residents to be part of that regional collaboration. That's part of the job. We're working for the residents. We don't just listen to the residents. We really go out and fight for them. Thank you. John. Yeah, <clears throat> representing the residents. You know, I've spoken over 25 times at the council meeting here about the impacts and, and high density. Well, I also went and spoke at the San Jose uh, council meeting too. The elephant in the room is the uh, San Jose urban villages that are coming down Stevens Creek, our plan for uh, Bollinger, our plan for De Anza Boulevard. San Jose has property in all those places. At any rate, uh, about, uh, what was it, six, eight months ago, they were considering the heights on uh, the San Jose uh, Stevens Creek uh, urban village coming right down into Cupertino the uh, Shell gas station at Stern and Stevens Creek raising the heights. I went and spoke at that about the impacts to the houses on the residents. Steve Scharf, council member, also spoke. Ultimately, we weren't successful, but I look forward to going back to San Jose and saying, hey, we need to collaborate. Please don't just bring your, your uh, uh, plans into Cupertino on De Anza Boulevard without us. Thank you, Oren, to close. Um, I don't have much to add to that. I mean, we all, we all know that we need to work together. Uh, it's, it's just a question of how and, and, uh, how the, and what approach. Um, I think in a couple of cases, some of our approaches have uh, been a little more adversarial than I would like. I mean, I, th I do agree with Darcy that you've got to s uh, speak up for yourself, but uh, there are ways of doing that. Uh, in a positive way that, that we're gonna build the right relationships in the long term, and that's what I'd hope to do. Great, thank you. All right. Well, we spoke earlier about um, what we don't have enough of in terms of transportation. Uh, Tara, why don't you start us off with something that everyone agrees we have too much of, which is traffic. Thanks. Uh, well, having lived in Cupertino my entire life, I've slowly seen the evolution of our neighborhood streets becoming highways and sometimes of the day parking lots for commuters. Um, as long as we have job growth and ec the economic growth we've seen, we're always going to have traffic, but we can put in some relief measures. Um, but as long as 80% of us are driving in single occupancy vehicles, which is the case now, we're not going to see much traffic relief anytime soon. That's just the reality of the situation. So how do we get people out of their individual cars? One, we provide alternatives. Two, it's a lifestyle change for most folks. Some policies we can pursue requiring car share parking spots. One car share vehicle will take nine to 13 vehicles in traffic off the road. We can expand our parent carpooling programs. We can implement transportation management plans uh, with caps on drive alone trips as was done as, at the Apple II campus which requires that 34% of the employees got to work either on bicycle, on foot, via public transit, not in a single occupancy car. The city can also offer discounts or transit vouchers. Maybe if people try uh, buses for a month free, they'll continue to use it. We can encourage that the businesses and our library, in fact, supply secure bike racks. 
At the same time, I want to prioritize pedestrian safety and ensure that criteria behind different traffic mitigations are not just geared to those in traffic, but are geared to bicyclists and pedestrians. For instance, deterring uh, folks from parking or loading in bike lanes, especially at our school sites. I'd want to use my experience working with traffic engineers to realize traffic and safety improvements and bring it to this role. I got a good, some good news today. I got a text that an initiative that I started to get an automatic shutoff valve working with pg and &E at a gas pipeline under a school today was successful. So hopefully that'll prevent an explosion at that school. Um, lastly, I want to add that a jobs to housing balance is linked to lowering traffic congestion. So how we plan our city also has a major impact on traffic. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Tim. So again, I, I like the idea of offering vouchers. Um, you have to remember, not everybody makes a ton of money. So when they go to ride public transportation, and like BART, it's unbelievable. It's like, wow, it's expensive. Why? It doesn't make sense. I am total advocate of funding those programs. I think it's great. I, but again, I go back to what I told you. They're not riding these things. They're not riding light rail. So maybe, maybe they figure it's not worth the headache. So we, we, have to, we have to offer an incentive to get people to do it. And that's the only way it's gonna ever work to, to minimize some of this disaster that we see on the road and accidents, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Liang. Hi. So traffic is the, the most important issue on everyone's mind, especially those people who are currently commuting to Cupertino because commuting in to Cupertino is very, very tough. It's killing. And our teachers, they mostly have already a house somewhere in more affordable areas. They commute in. Some of them come in at 6 o'clock. They have to leave at 3 right away to avoid traffic jam. And as a result, our students couldn't have after-school cl clubs because there is no teacher to supervise them. If we build a lot of cramped space in, in Valco, do you think these teachers would want to move to Valco? No, they have their homes, that's comfortable. But then when you add 10,000 more workers, 8,000 residents in Valco, you are going to double their commute time. And that will affect them a lot. Thank you, Darcy. We need to be forward looking when it comes to the traffic solution. Now, when we're talking about connecting Cupertino to a major transit hub, such as Deardon Station, VTA, yes, is okay with bus rapid transit. However, that is the path of least resistance. Bus, bus rapid transit goes down the median, and it will prevent cars from turning left uh, while they're going in either direction. It also is subject to a certain degree uh, to the traffic signals. It is not gonna get you there faster. We need to be innovative. We need to take back the mantle of innovation in transit. Because when we do that, that is what's gonna have a full-fledged transit solution. Now, VDA, um, from what I understand, has an appetite for going underground. That could be very expensive. But consider, if we're gonna take a very um, novel and innovative type of technology, we can also have elevated rail. The, the question is, will people accept their view sheds from being, so to speak, contaminated along Stevens Creek and Stan San Carlos? I'm trying to get all of these factors out there so people understand the various tensions that are going through uh, with all of these, uh, uh, all these different conversations. Thanks very much. Thank you. Savita. Uh, I just want to confirm the question is about traffic and it's not transit. Um, and to speak about uh, transit and traffic, is, it's, it's not the same. And especially when we're talking about uh, above ground, that's aspirational. There's land use decisions and view sheds. So that's not a relief for traffic. For traffic, we have to think in terms of uh, intelligent traffic signals. We need to think of how we can speed on, uh, in increase speed on the major corridors and reduce speeds in our residential neighborhoods so that waves does not send people through our residential areas, especially where in our school zones. Uh, one of the things I really work hard on is safe routes to school. 
uh, and I worked with Fremont Union High School District to get the POGO program, which is piloted now at Cupertino High School. We are hoping it will be a success so we can have it throughout the city. And then I also got the right program working with VT and County for seniors so that they have something where, because they don't know how to use Uber Lyft on their smartphones. Uh, the, we also invested heavily on our uh, bike implementation plan, and we also have approved an ordinance where kids under the age of 12 can ride on their, on their sidewalks, on their bicycles, and we hope the school districts will support those plans. Thank you, Hung. Okay, long-term traffic solutions, build housing close to work, build housing close to transit, build real transit into our region. Short-term wise, um, a shuttle bus, that's Falco specific plan is gonna provide, and uh, build more bikeways, safe bikeways and uh, walkways to encourage biking and walking, and also implement new technology car sharing uh, with our Pogo Ride program at Cupertino High School, thanks Savita. And also, uh, such as uh, Tara mentioned, Apple's transportation demand system that reduced 34%. That's exactly what Velco specific two plan that offers. They have offered transportation demand system, and it's $11 million uh, with, a, with other trail walkways. That's gonna reduce 34% of the business travels. So this, in turn, reduces single vehicle occupation vehicles and also uh, reduces um, vehicle travel miles, that's good for the environment. Everything's entwined, so short term, long term, that's what we need to do. We need to be doers. Instead of being afraid of moving forward, we need to solve issues. Thank you, John. <clears throat> yeah, we need to solve issues and we need to use a little math. 10,000 employees and the traffic manual says each employee has an average of 3.6 trips per day. 3.6 trips per day, they're going to work, they're going home for work, some are going to lunch, some are coming back, some have visitors. So 3.6 times 10,000 is 36,000 trips per day for 1.75 million square feet of office. If you don't address that, all you're doing is adding to the problem. Even if we try to do some mitigation, which I intend to try to do, make some, some improvements, some of it with the signals, some of it with turn lanes on Stevens Creek, De Anza Boulevard, uh, McClellan, some of our, our problem places. But if we are going to get ourselves in the predicament of adding this massive amount of traffic at Valco, that's just the office component. That's not the housing component and it's not the retail. That's just the office. Thank you. Thank you. Warren. Yeah, so look, uh, in real estate, it's location, location, location. With traffic, it's time, time, and time. You know, it's how long does it take total time from when you leave one location to get to the other location. Um, and that's why, uh, and it's convenience. Uh, San Francisco, that has probably the best public transit in the Bay Area, is losing public transit ridership to Uber and Lyft because of the convenience, because of the time. So you go, wait a minute, you know, these guys are still stuck in the same old traffic. But if you're not driving, it changes the dynamic. You can be doing other things while your driver or in the future your autonomous car is doing it. That's why Apple employees don't mind an hour commute maybe from San Francisco because they're doing their work on the bus. So we need to look at what's gonna happen in the future and how that's gonna work um, and not look at yesterday's solutions to this problem. All right, thank you, Tara. To close up and solve our traffic problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we're in an interesting position because we've seen so much economic growth and prosperity in this region because of high tech and companies like Apple. But now traffic and housing uh, is threatening the future of our tech economy. And tech companies themselves are having difficulty retaining and recruiting workers. Uh, workers and teachers are commuting from farther and farther away to the point where they'll just stop making the commute. I think we collectively agreed on a lot. Uh, a jobs housing balance would, would lower traffic. We need to be forward looking. Um, parent carpooling was mentioned, TDMs, and ridership in Cupertino, I believe, is 2%. Countywide, it's not much better. So it would have to be a, a lifestyle change when you think about public transit. Um, and it's pa at this point, practically, we can just give out public transit vouchers for free. It's, most of it's coming out of our tax, the taxpayer's pocket. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, 
Not by design, but purely <laughs> by coincidence. The last topic of the evening uh, will be something um, you people may have heard of, <laughs> Valco. Uh, we really didn't plan it this way. But uh, Tim will lead us off with Valco. Lead, um, I thought you were going to say lead off in a prayer. <laughs> so <laughs> today, today, Randolph Holm, the former city attorney, filed a lost multi-million dollar lawsuit against Cupertino, stating he was wrongfully terminated because he was vocal about the city's, uh, they were not following the city general plan. So I'll start off by saying I'm not a SB 35 fan whatsoever. Um, it's disappointing when, when you look at what may end up being there. I, I, again, would love to see the city progress to a point where we have nice housing. I am not a proponent of the low income housing. I could take you around and I could show you reasons why. And I can prove it with statistics on crime. So being in security for 35, 30 some years, I can prove it to you that it does change the scope of the city. It does change up. When you change the element and the different people come in to your city, it changes. So it's reality. If that's what people desire, it will affect a lot of the things. I, again, uh, would love to see new housing. I would love to have seen a senior, senior community built in there, but that's not part of the plan. I'm not a high density plan uh, follower or believer. I, I don't think that's a really good, uh, and again, the huge bunch, bunch of office space, what's it ultimately gonna be used for? Um, I loved Valco, but it's dead. You know, it's gone and we have to, we have to move forward and hopefully with something that's gonna make the city shine and not bring down the city with crime. Thank you. Thank you. Liang? Velco was still on the regional shopping and the general commercial three weeks ago, and the council approved a much bigger plan, bigger than the one voter voted down two years ago. Many voters are surprised, and many are now lining up in the in front of the library to sign petition. What I see as a, a roadmap for a better vocal is we put this current plan on hold to put it on the public vote and then we elect new city council members so that only sensible projects could be accepted in Cupertino, not oversized office park. And then because the SB35 project is in fact non-compliant, there are many major issues as we have seen, the city attorney even didn't, didn't agree it's compliant. And then we would be able to move on to a better vocal plan. That's restart the community process to, to come up with a plan we can all agree with. Then we can select between the tier two plan and a much better vocal plan. Thank you. Darcy. We need to do our work on council. That's just the bottom line here. We should not have not pushed back on the 2 million square feet of office at the end of 2014. We should have looked at the 2 million square foot of office allocation at the end of 2017. These were things that if you don't do that kind of uh, critical thinking and analysis, you're gonna create a development community that thinks that, well, Cupertino just doesn't do its work. And so I don't malign the development community. I think we need a council majority that will look at things and go, if we're being asked for two million square feet of office, let's critically think about what we really need. Let's critically think about what the impact is gonna be on housing. And let's not try to say, well, we're gonna have a regional solution now because regionally we still need to put those homes somewhere. And our jurisdictions exist and they have borders for a reason. And when you look at these imbalances, they're imbalanced for a reason and there are, are significant repercussions as a result. If you're gonna bargain, do pro formas, do your homework. Thank you very much. If we had made any changes in November of 2017, we would have had the weight of the state as well as the developer on us and we'd be facing a different set of lawsuits. And that was made clear to us when the suggestion came to us to change midstream. 
we went through four years of discussions. We've gone through planning, outreach, consultants, uh, seminars, educating the public, inviting the community to give us what their vision, what they want to see. And that is how we came up with the Valco uh, Tier 2 specific plan, as opposed to SB 35, which could give us no mitigation for traffic, nothing for schools, uh, nothing for the community, whereas it, the Tier 2 gives us several, several, uh, to $24.5 million for both the school districts, traffic mitigation, shuttle services, Valco 280 interchange, the Performing Arts Center, and a city hall which we would never have seen if it hadn't been for working with the developer in open, transparently, in front of the community. Thank you. Hung Wei. So, as the uh, water recycling plant uh, for uh, is a private-public collaboration among the city of Sunnyvale, Apple, and the uh, water district, Valco species plant too, it's really a model of private public collaboration too. Yes, it's not perfect, but it's much better than SB 35 with all the benefits that Safida just said, I can name a few. $30 million for City Hall, $22 million for a Performing Arts Center, $14 and a quarter million dollar cash to CUSD, a 25,000 million a square footage of a facility for dog school and innovation center for Fremont Union High School District, $11 million for traffic mitigation, I'm running out of time, and shuttle bus services and all these. Yes, we do have a lot of housing, which is inclusive housing. I disagree that inclusive housing is going to bring crime. You know, our quality of life would not be compromised by inclusive housing. So I am advocating for inclusive housing and good benefits and private public collaboration. Thank you. John. <clears throat> Having knocked on doors for four years now, I have a pretty good feel for, for what the residents want. How many of you think you, your neighbors want 13-story buildings? This pro-developer uh, three councilman that approved this, how many of your neighbors want that? Or the 22-story SB 35? Well, Randy Holm has now published uh, his lawsuit that says it's non-compliant. Quit threatening with us, us with something that's not compliant. Do your homework, Council. For you three and the other two candidates that seem to think, oh, we have to do what the developer says or he's going to sue us. No, we sue him. His SB 35 is non-compliant. You guys don't want 13-story buildings. Where have you seen uh, uh, mixed use, 13 stories? I hear the other councilman saying, it doesn't pencil out, the office has to pay for it. Monticello at Lawrence and Monroe has zero office. It's 16 acres, it's all housing and retail. It didn't pencil out, then why did it get built? Do your homework. Thank you. Oren. Yeah, so how are those lawsuits working out for you? With Measure C, but let's not go there. So. <laughs> I wish we had a time machine. If we had a time machine, we could go back two years and after measure C and D both failed, we could have maybe gone and tweaked the, the Hills at Valco plan to come up with something, maybe more housing, a little less office, uh, something that I think would have been a showcase for the city. We don't have a time machine. So in my opinion, we have two choices now. We have an SB 35 plan that I believe is, has been validated and will stay validated. And we have the specific plan, which as you heard, is superior to the SB 35 plan in virtually every way, starting with traffic. If you're worried about traffic, one plan has zero traffic mitigation. The other has the same kind of traffic mitigation for the office that we approved with Apple Park, where a third of the people have to take alternative, <coughs> excuse me, alternative transportation. So in my opinion right now, um, putting a referendum on a ballot is playing a game of chicken uh, with the residents of this city that uh, they're going to end up potentially with SB 35, which would be a, a much worse project. Thank you. Tara. Thanks. Well, first off, I just want to start by saying that affordable housing won't lead to crime and it won't make your property values go down. I just want to bust that myth right now. If you need data to back that up, send me an email. Um, I think we're in a tricky position because what a lot of folks want is not financially feasible. You know, just taking to an extreme, all retail is not going to get built all retail and 300 units of housing is not gonna get built. You could approve it, but it would just sit there. No developer would build that. Um, and to be quite honest, I don't think we could get a project with less than 1,700 units of housing. And if we wanted to reduce the office space, we'd need to increase the housing there. So I think as leaders, we need to be transparent and truthful and 
what could actually get built. Um, and I know a lot of folks um, oppose tier two. I wouldn't have voted for tier two either because it brings in a lot more jobs than housing. I preferred tier one. Um, but we need to be realistic in what can actually get built at Valco. Uh, and a lot of people oppose tier two for different reasons, so it's hard to collectively agree on something. Uh, people have lost faith in their government. We need to prepare for SB 35 in the future and also study if community benefits add anything extra if they're worth all these concessions. Great. Thank you. And Tim, so any all we final can, comments? All we can hope is SB 35 gets eliminated at a given point in our life. But again, when you, when you change the landscape and you add people, you add more law enforcement requirements, you had a lot of a lot of different services that we're going to be paying for so i don't think that this was ever negotiated correctly in my opinion from doing the research that i've done um, i don't and i don't think the citizens were done right with the at the end of the day so um, please just hope we don't get stuck with the sb35 plan because it, it would be disastrous for the city thank you very much well, thank you everyone for your comments and especially for your hard work and willingness to commit to represent our community. Uh, I'd like to conclude this evening's activities with uh, statements from each of the candidates. Uh, allow up to uh, two minutes. Uh, and we'll begin with Liang. So I'd like to add that I would like a community-friendly vocal with significant portion for retail, shopping, entertainment, and more, not just 4% of the entire project as uh, retail. And I would like to have some housing, moderate amount, and sufficient parkland and parking space, a plan that's well publicized, well discussed in the community before its approval. I ran for Cupertino Union School District because the school district was in crisis. Now we've brought positive changes because we build, we've rebuilt trust and transparency. Unfortunately, in the past two, three years, many troubling events have increased my frustra frustration with the city leadership. We might not recognize our beloved Cupertino in a few years. I would like to bring positive changes to Cupertino. If elected, most likely a new board member will be appointed to replace me. Most likely there won't be a special election as a lot of board members have, are usually appointed. And I'm committed to continue to be open and accessible to all the families for city and school issues. There should be no more council members, members who collaborate but mostly with developers and the special interest while leaving the residents in the dark. No more council members who say they care and then rubber stamp whatever dense projects put before them. No more. We need council members who believe in grassroots democracy and ask tough questions to keep the city staff, developers, and polluters accountable. We, the people, should be the drivers of our future. Join me in this campaign for a better Cupertino. Vote for Liang Chao. Vote for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Darcy Paul. I was raised to have intelligence and integrity. And I will tell you, my parents did not have an easy job. It was uh, very difficult. And as parents, we all know that that is something that we aspire to for our children. I've tried to serve in the last four years with honor on the city council, and I think I've done it. I'm not gonna spend this time to talk about how unfair a lot of these attacks have been uh, this last year, but I will tell you one thing. Look at our fundraising filings. Look at the fundraising filings of the field, and you'll get a sense of who is willing to do the work. I knew that it is a good idea before going into a campaign season to raise your limit. I'm the only person who raised the $30,000 needed by June 30th. The reason I tell you this is that that is not easy to do. You need foresight, you need to go out and try to get the grassroots funding from the people that support you. And so examine the fundraising filings. Also examine the fundraising filings to see what the repercussions of not doing your homework are. Because if the people that support you happen to be well-moneyed interests, they will put a lot of money into your campaigns, into your supporting causes. Um, and so with regard to trying to figure out 
Who's out there doing the thinking? Who's out there doing the work? I want you to take a look at the filings. It's cupertino.org, and you can take a look at where all the money is going into and where the money comes from. Um, I want to give a plug for the developmentally disabled units of housing. I think that is critically important. Um, if we have uh, the various types of developments that we're looking at right now, uh, I would like to make sure that we support those uh, particular units. Um, in terms of the idea of uh, not being petty, let's take the pettiness out of our politics, okay? Um, just because I don't support a particular development plan doesn't mean that we should stop having parks in park deficient areas of Cupertino. Just because I didn't support a $70 million expenditure uh, for City Hall doesn't mean we shouldn't be expanding the library. Let us go ahead and work together. I absolutely believe in collaboration, but I also believe in democracy, and we should be comfortable with our disagreements, and we should rise above uh, the idea of gridlock and pettiness. Thank you very much. Thank you. Savita, two minutes. Thank you. Uh, I agree. Please look at the expenditure statement. I'm the only person who signed the voluntary limit of 29,000. You can look at mine with the exact same place that uh, Darcy mentioned. It's on cupertino.org. Um, uh, my top three priorities are transportation, housing, and the environment. And I always say, if you don't look at both together, the environment is at stake. So please think of transportation and housing as two sides of a coin. If the coin lands on the edge, it's our environment at stake which is why I voted for tier two. We have to have housing for people of all abilities. It's easy to talk about it, but it's very difficult to make it happen. SB 35 does not give us the opportunity to bring development, especially for people of all incomes and abilities. I voted so that we can have the disadvantaged disabled in our community. I voted so we can have the seniors in our community. I voted so we can have teachers in our community. If they leave, what will happen to our schools? So that is why I voted for this project. It is extremely important that we make sure it goes through, and it's extremely important that we don't think that the developer will not build SB 35, because they came to the last council meeting and said that they would. Um, I also want to talk about all the groups that have endorsed me, the Sierra Club, the League of Conservation of Voters, the Democratic Club, the Dean's Democratic Club. Thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for supporting me. I have all these endorsements because people have seen me as someone who can work with different organizations, reach across the aisle, talk to other cities. Traffic and pollution does not respect city boundaries. We need to work with our neighboring cities and the neighboring mayors and city council members as well as county supervisors all support me because I've been working with them to come up with solutions, both for housing and traffic in our region, and short-term solutions for people in our community. So please give me your vote, Savita Vaidinathan. I'm number three on the ballot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Two minutes. As your council member, I would devote my time, energy, and resources in being a leader who studies issues, seeks to understand all perspectives, and brings people together to find real solutions, real solutions that are economically viable to be implemented. I will make sure to bring my budget uh, energy budget um, expertise from Fremont Union High School District to manage our budget, to make sure we have fiscal health, and to build great relationships with our employee groups and also to prioritize our budget toward the quality of life of our residents. I will make sure that Valco is a beneficial project that makes our schools and cities stronger, build correlations with neighboring cities and negotiate with Apple to bring real resources for our transit solutions to the region. I also make sure that every development that will include moderate income housing for our teachers in order to protect the quality of our education. I'll continue to advocate for cleaner energy resources leading us toward a healthier future. With 11 years of school board experience, I have proven leadership and regional consensus building skills. That's why all my colleagues on the Fremont Union High School District endorsed me, including 11 Cupertino mayors. Vote Hung Wei on November 6th, number four, we can build the best Cupertino together. Thank you. John. So I'm running because the three pro-developer councilmen are not representing us. I strongly believe that the most important responsibility of an elected official is to represent the residents. Not the developers, the residents. 
the arguments for saying, oh, this is good, this is good on these things, if it's not what the residents want, it's not what the residents want. All those arguments are meaningless. I've been reaching out to residents for the last four years. Can you believe it? It's been going on for four years. Probably some of you have seen me knocking on your doors. I will be continuing to reach out and engage the residents to make sure I know what the residents want. And that's what I will be bringing to the council, the residents' voice, the grassroots. This is our community. This is our home. I'm raising my three kids here. I have a regular career. I'm not here for a job. But our community has a problem. We're not being listened to. Us residents are not deciding our future. The developer is. I've talked to so many residents. They want sensible growth. Keep giving me the input that you want, and I will keep bringing, bringing it to the council meetings. I want to hear what the residents want. And when a, count, when a developer comes and stands in front at the podium, I want to hear him say, this is something the residents are going to like, not its critical mass. That's what Peter Powell said. I want this 2 million square feet because it's the critical mass. I already told you, Monticello has no office in it. Did it not pencil out? Absolutely it penciled out. Thank Vote you. Vote for John Willie. Thank you. Warren Mahoney. So voting for me, you get proven performance. I was nine years on the council. When I was on the council, I had a wide variety of people I worked with, from Chris Wang, Barry Chang, Mark Santoro, Rod Sinks, Dolly, and uh, Sandoval, and Gilbert Wong. And believe me, they didn't all agree on how to do things and what we should do. But we worked together, and in almost every case, we compromised, worked together and came up with a solution. Probably the best example of that is Apple Park. Kind of an interesting uh, story there. That started with two diametrically opposed views. Apple's view is any other city in the country or in the world would kill to have this project there, and you want us to do what? And then our, my fellow council members' view is this company has more money than most small countries, and they won't even do what? And we worked through that. We worked through that to where the final result was a 4-0 vote, where Apple walked away happy and the city walked away happy. And as the projects come in, the traffic mitigation and things that they did and promised have worked out. And, and, and we've developed the, the project there. This residence thing is a very interesting thing. I talked earlier about, in Apple's case, what is it? Was it Apple against the residents? No, we were working together to do the best thing for the residents in terms of getting economic viability, both in the jobs, which are important, and in the direct and indirect benefits. We talked about hotels and transient occupancy taxes. Who do you think is going in there? You can do what the residents want, but it has to be balanced. If a resident says, I want to park next door to me, you can't just say, oh, okay tear down your house and put a park in there. It has to be a balance, it has to be worked together. You gotta get the best thing for the city as a whole and something that works. And that's what we need to do and that's what I help, can help do. Thank you. Tara Shri Krishnan. Thank you, Rick. Uh, so I decided to run for this position um, a while back and I never thought I would be running for public office. Uh, you know, I come from being a staffer, doing the dirty work behind the scenes. But I decided to run because on a personal level, one, I value public service um, genuinely, and those are the values I was taught growing up here in Cupertino. Two, I love our community, um, and I have vested interest in where we are now and 20, 30 years from now. And three, I genuinely felt like City Hall and our City Council could do a better job of serving residents. Since then, my campaign has been rooted in truth, transparency, and integrity. Hopefully, I've earned most folks' trust by now, because even when it was unpopular, I was completely transparent about where I stood on every issue, whether it was Valco, SB 35, the head tax. I wrote articles. I posted on my website. I spoke up. And whenever you take a stand, you risk losing support. But I think uh, that's the role of a leader, is to present your views and what's best for the community, even if it's not what, what people want to hear. 
So as a candidate and councilwoman, I'll continue to be truthful, transparent, and lead with integrity. I wanted to mention I have earned the endorsement of our state senator, our state controller, 15 mayors and council members across the Bay Area, elected leaders at the city, county, state, and federal level, was endorsed by the Sierra Club, the Democratic Party, and a long list of Cupertino community members. I do have my priorities and fleshed out policy proposals for just about every initiative I want to work on laid out on my website, including climate change, which we weren't able to address today. And please excuse the fact that my website's pretty detailed and wonky. <laughs> Lastly, wanted to just thank my family and friends uh, and neighbors for being so supportive throughout this process, uh, who took time to canvas or either made a grassroots donation. And you'll receive more thank yous after November. All right, thank you. Tim Gorshalowski. Thank you very much. And you almost said it correctly. So <laughs> over the past 25 years, uh, I've produced, nego negotiated for my business well over $100 million. And I didn't do it by being lazy or sitting back saying, oh, how come such and such? I did it because I'm a go-getter and I get up and I, I sleep about four or five hours a night. So I'm very busy and I love meeting with people. You could probably tell I love to talk to people. But the one good thing people always forget when I'm talking all the time, I listen to every word people say and it's vital, it's so important. And I think that's a huge thing that will build either a successful person or unsuccessful. If you're not good at listening to people, you're not gonna make it. So I love to have meetings with people to hear what's going on in your community. I do that now and I'm not even on the council. But I, you know, I have people call me, hey, what do you think I ought to do about this problem or this issue? And give them direction. And it's huge. And I, I do that as a citizen. So I, I would love to serve on the council to make a difference. And maybe some of my views may not be the identical to your views, but they're, they're made from the heart. And, and I've, I've employed over the years thousand, well, well, in excess of a thousand employees. Back in 2003, I'll share this little blurb with you. Uh, we, we brought over the, um, well, actually, the, some of the churches brought over the Lost Boys from Sudan what the movie was made about. And so uh, we employed, uh, I think it was 17 of them, of the, the 23 that came over. And we actually took them and it, was, it actually made the news and it was a big deal at the time. But those are things that I do. And we taught, we taught these guys how to speak English. And we got them, we got them uh, licensed through the state to work. And it was fun. And I still see those guys to this day. So I love things like that. I love promoting kids and the, and the people out in the community to be able to work. And thank you very much for sitting here listening to me during this time. I really appreciate all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our candidates. Uh, please join me in expressing your appreciation for, for our neighbors, uh, people up here who care enough about Cupertino to really, truly get in involved, uh, certainly as involved as it might be possible to do. Uh, so uh, please, a round of applause. Thanks. Thank you, and if you haven't voted already, November 6th. <laughs> right. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, Rick. Some people probably haven't voted. That's right. All right. Some have. Some have.